what is the real paradigm of the STEM education? So should, should we focus on teaching facts or should we just be happy with playing a little bit and thinking we are engaging the intellect? Or are these two things two phases of the educational approaches and processes which are swapping across the history? Very much looks like that because, because there are always periods where people just focus more on the content, on the engaging of the intellect part, just trying to understand the situation, trying to understand the concepts, etc. And then there is the more, as we mathematicians say, engineering part, trying to focus on teaching facts, just memorize things. Memorizing things is much more efficient. You can just design your, your future statistics result. You can just tell, you will know this by heart, and I will just check it next Thursday. That's very easy to achieve. It's quite easy to plan. It's quite easy to manage. You can have a real delivery management. So therefore, the teachers, at least in Czech Republic, love them. So in the grammar school, the kids are told what they should be telling on Thursday and what they should learn. And that's two, two periods. And, and in history, you can always just track down which was dominating or just exclusive. But it also could be two parts which are going in parallel and are part of the same, of one teaching and learning process. And that's, that's exactly what the STEM education, so the paradigm of this approach, should like to go for. But let us come back to the original question. What is the role of the mathematics really? So I just had a look at the etymology dictionary, and it's much more helpful that you would think because if you go back in the history you find out that I mean most of the people say that mathematic comes from Latin mathematic and it's a singular noun which was replaced in 17th century by mathematics which is a plural in English but it's not true in it's not true in say Czech or Russian there it remained the same for mathematica mathematica and if you go much more back, you find out that actually it comes from the Greek words which are rather describing the approach to things. So I learned them from philologists that in the very old occurrences which are, which are uh, traced back, there were two kinds of pupils, those who were advanced enough to make their own conclusions and sort of think about what they are learning, and they were called mathematicos. Whereas the other ones were called something like listeners, just only listening and trying to memorize. So, so that's the original word, the original content of mathematics. And you can trace the remnants of the, of the word in many other languages. I will not go into any details, but you can see it in, in German under the word uh, munter being alive, being just fresh, fresh to perceive things, etc. And what would what would say the parents of the kids say who are now teased with mathematics in the school or, or the people who are not really mathematicians? So would they would they say that mathematics is counting with numbers or do they remember that it was just some some formal sets of rules, how to reshuffle letters, and, and then getting the riddles solved, how to get some results. So, <coughs> as far as I know, it's very difficult to convince the people that actually mathematics is a way of thinking, a way of approaching, approaching the problems. So I think a very good illustration of what the people could, could think and how they could look at the mathematician is this nice comics of Calvin and Hobbes. So Calvin is the boy, Hobbes is the tiger. And Calvin is questioning his homework in mathematics. And he says, well, you know, I don't think math is a science. It's a religion. And then he explains that's because all the equations 
are like miracles. You add some numbers and then you get some new ones and all that has to be appreciated or understood only by faith. And therefore he claims it's a religion and the whole book can be, can be perceived and accepted only on faith. And then they conclude that they should call a lawyer because, because Calvin declares himself as a mathematic, mathematics atheist and therefore he should be relieved, excused from this. So we can go a step further, so universe. What do you think some, some famous people told about mathematics? So, for example, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe made a claim that the mathematicians are like Frenchmen. Whatever you say, they translate into their own language and immediately get something entirely different. But that's a polite and nice, I will come back to that, to, to that quote immediately after this slide, but there are much worse. So, so St. Augustine wrote in his book, De Genesia Literam, very many centuries ago, that a good Christian should beware of mathematicians and all those who make empty prophecies. The danger already exists that mathematicians have made a covenant with the devil to darken the spirit and confine men in the bonds of hell. So that's what we were considered as mathematicians, say, this many centuries back. And even, even more interesting, at least for me, therefore it's a third point, it's Martin Luther, the Protestant religion creator. So he thought that while medicine made the people ill and theologists made them sinful, mathematics makes them sad. And that's something I do not understand very much. So in one of the first slides here, I will come back to that. I had, well, here. I had two pictures here. On the right hand side, that's how, how I at least have the feeling our students are coming. They are self-confident. They want to do something and they want to play with something. And they meet the teachers and, and they don't know what to think. So that's on the left hand side. And therefore, I just copied the same picture here again. And I thought that that's one of the possible explanations why Martin Luther <coughs> thought that mathematics makes the people sad. Because, I don't know, perhaps they have the feeling that there are so many among them who have got this snake already spiraling around and telling the, the devil's words to them. So, let's come to the, to the first quote, the Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's one. Because his observation is actually pretty good. So, Indeed, I think mathematics should be first of all understood and thus it should be also taught the way as a foreign language. And if you imagine how foreign languages are taught, I don't, don't know again how they are taught in Russia, but I got a quite horrible, horrible teaching of, of languages. So my classes of languages always consisted in having columns of words and other columns of words and you had to learn the exact way and it didn't it didn't matter at all whether it's, it's it's just the only possible translation of the word or whether there are some nuances around who who cared it was just the homework to learn by the heart that this column of words has got this meaning and then separately there was some some discussion about the grammar and and, and there you just learn some small bricks of the grammar in a very abstract way and all that was supposed to be put together. And then later I, I read some study by, by neurologists and psychologists who explained that if the small kids are not meeting uh, foreign languages before they are at most three or four years old, then inevitably they will be the whole life long, they will be using another part of their brains to work with other languages in their own, then what they do with their own language. But my belief was when I saw that, that it was just because of the method of learning, because the method of learning the languages this stupid way was creating something like a block. 
just blocking the possibilities, the natural possibilities to use the foreign language the same way as you use your own language. And so I mean that mathematics should be trying, or the math, math teachers should be trying to avoid this, this same catastrophe. And so we should rather imitate how the foreign languages are learned. So the people should try to, to perceive and play a little bit with some concepts and approaches and methods and arguments and algorithms without trying to completely understand them in a formal way, completely enjoy every fine detail. And exactly as with a, with a foreign language, they rather have to, to, sort of, to sort of continually try to understand and grasp more and more and build their own layered understanding of the things. So therefore, we should not insist too much on perfection until we reach some reasonable level. And definitely, the absolutely best way would be if, if other subjects in the, set, say, grammar school or secondary school level would use the mathematical approach of discussion and explanation of things so that the people in their math lectures could just recognize the approaches and, and seeing how nicely they could be described in the more, more abstract way. That's exactly not what's normally happening. At least it was not happening in the schools when I was there. It was not happening in the schools when my kids were there. And I'm afraid that my grandchildren, who are now five, three, two, old, two years old, they will not meet it in their schools again. Because that's, some, that's simply something what the geographers or, or biologists or others are simply not doing. And instead, you are hearing uh, some, some uh, claims or, or conclusions like the other day I was driving a car and there was, there was some news that the scientists have found out that it's, it's, it's been proved that drinking sweet coffee helps to get slim. And the argument was that there was a statistics on a big sample and something like 67 people, 67 percent of people who drink sweet coffee are slim, and, th and therefore they concluded it's just good to get slim. Right? And that's exactly, exactly what a mathematician would never do or should never do, because you have to see for 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 the relations really. So, so all this approach is behind the science, technology, engineering, and math paradigm. So the mathematical approach would be rather spread within of the science and technology lectures. And in the math classes, the people should be already recognizing how beautifully it can get into the hands if you just do it properly then. So the next question, how do we then teach mathematics? So definitely, most of my colleagues do or, or appreciate the approach that they want to do everything completely perfectly and completely right, which means that they just cut off a small piece of mathematics, say, for example, infinite power series. And then they want to be the best one in the world and, and, and present it in a most elegant way to the students and tell all the tiny details and tell them all the beautiful things and what happens if it, if it converges absolutely, and what happens if not, and how you can rearrange it, and all the tiny details are there. And they believe that if, if these small tiny bricks are done in the absolute most precise and beautiful way, then the good students will just work through, and finally they come to their own beautiful construction of the entire mathematics, and they will learn everything the right way. The other possibility is just to focus better on the right things. And if you better focus on the right things and try to present them immediately as useful tools, then of course you can't be very precise in all the tiny details and you can't have the ambition to place every single concept to your curriculum only at a point where you are already having all the tools to deal with them. So I have, for example, colleagues who strictly believe that you can't deal with power series 
earlier than the third semester, for example, because, because you don't have all the integral calculus there and it would be too complicated for the students. And so they don't tell them simply in the beginning that actually, actually we are working only with polynomials because we can't do more than final number of additions and multiplications and no computer will do more than final number of, of additions and multiplications in, in their own lifespan and therefore it's just an abstract abstract simulation, abstract approximation of polynomials who have got too many coefficients and so we better speak about power series <laughs> and you can tell the kids that you can work with the power series exactly as with the polynomials at least formally and you can tell them immediately that you just integrate and differentiate term by term and then you immediately can tell them that whatever kind of say differential equations you write down if you assume analyticity, analyticity uh, if it's power series then you can turn it into combinatorial problem which you can't solve anyhow but you can immediately get at least some approximation and the people just see that it's something like a useful tool you can go do directly to numerics and so so you can hope that those students who, will, who would like to work with that in, in detail they will later finally come to look at all the details on their own but at least there is a good chance they understand the links and they understand the reason they understand the use and that's very similar to the foreign language there if you do it the normal natural way like the best way to learn language for a, for a boy is to get a girlfriend who doesn't speak his language and then of course it very simply and very quickly learns word by word and in the beginning the, the, the understanding is not perfect but it, it evolves fast so that's what I mean and so of course we shouldn't try to provide complete exposition of some very restricted area or piece of mathematics immediately in the first time so because it's just exactly like with the foreign language if you if you just immediately from the scratch want to make some some clear distinction where you use the, the perfectum and when it should be the plus quam perfectum so pro perhaps the people never ever will learn to speak really so <clears throat> that also brings the need that you you simply touch the topics and you should spiddle like like in the Hegel's sense in philosophy so so there is no way of understanding which could be reached at the first moment you have in mathematics you have always spill around the concepts and come back to what what you thought you were already understanding and you come back and, and you, you you see that you didn't etc so any questions i'm coming to a new new chapter not the case <laughs> so let me go on so let me come back to one of the things I mentioned and that's the perception of the people the perception of the students perception is a very interesting concept in psychology and if you ask different psychologists they will tell you different answers so what I mean is just mainly the perception from the point of view how it's described in Carl Jung's approach to the personal typology of people so of course we should be interested how the students perceive what we are telling them or or what kind of homeworks they are getting and of course we should and we want and very often we achieve the task we want to pass the experience of ours and the opinions we've got that's the main goal of the activity of teacher right and this is quite well working face-to-face -face contact in particular if the teacher has got some opinions which are deeper and some experience how to explain that in face-to-face -face he simply looks into the eyes of the other person and repeats the thing so many times as necessary or goes from another angle etc and this often fails with big groups so we should or mostly fails with big groups so we should ask why and my answer to that is that a big part of the why answer is that 
the typology of the, per of the individual people is so much different and the way they perceive information is absolutely different. And whereas with learning, say, cooking in kitchen or, or driving car, the distinction or the difference in the abilities or, or possibilities how to pass the opinion and experience are less limited with such an abstract topic like mathematics is, it's really a big problem. So this is also the reason why I do not believe that there is any correct method how to lecture mathematics, at least for big groups. Simply, wherever you, you have some prescribed methods, and if, if it's state regulated or, I don't know, director regulated in that particular school, the risk that it fails is it's very big. The main part of this, I, I can't go into details of the psychologist's point of view in particular because I'm not educated in that direction enough, but just if we just want to touch it on the surface, I think that the main point is that some people need the intuitive picture first in order to be able and willing to think about something and to try something themselves. While the others perceive the things first of all via experimenting with the things following some prescribed number of steps. So just strictly speaking, the second group needs to get an algorithm and they go without much thinking through the algorithm seven times and if they notice it works always, then they are ready to think about what they were doing and why did it work. And it, not, it has nothing, nothing common with being or not being intelligent. It's just a different typology of people. So the intuitive people, they, they first have to see some picture, to have some general point of view, and then they get through the examples. The other ones are happy to get through simple exercises, just deal with matrices, exercise the calculus, and then to think what's behind. And if you look at the, at the books, so they usually, most of the books I know, they follow the intuition first approach. They first tell some abstract theory, some definitions, some theorems, and then they come to the exercises. All the exercises are in a different book. But usually, at least when I went to school, the exercises the tutorials were always after the lecture, not before the lecture. Whereas the other ones, they would very much appreciate to have it the other way around. And if you look at these American ways of calculus books, they are just having only the example there. And there is no, no real theory, no real picture about the result. And that's another disaster, because those people are not stupid. They just want to have made the exercises first but then they are interested in what they were doing. And no one tells them. So, so all this was addressed by Jung's in a much more complicated way because his interest was how the different typology of the people reflects in the symptoms of psychological diseases or neurological diseases because the same disease is seen by a completely different behavior of the people depending on their Typology. So therefore it's quite difficult to read it off there. But there is another resource, and that's the that's the much simplified version of what, what the HR people are using when they just deal with human resources and try to build teams and try to understand why someone gets the instructions and does the work and another one gets the same instruction and doesn't do the work, why some of the employees are happy with the way and why why others are not. So that's called the Myers-Briggs typology indicators. And there, it's a simple reflection of what I'm talking about. So what Myers and Briggs, it was a mother and, and daughter, both active in HR, what they, what they fiddled out of this Jung's approach was that they stick to Jung's original, or more or less stick to the original uh, concept of being either extrovert or introvert, which 
actually doesn't mean what you usually think it does. I mean, I mean, at least I, I was always told I was very extrovert because I like to sing for the people and I like to talk to the people, etc. Whereas the introvert people should be sitting somewhere in the corner and not talking much. But it's not the, it's not the case. So, so the original Jung's approach was that extrovert means that you, you perceive and, and understand yourself as living in some surrounding which you take as the basic source of information whereas, whereas the internal feelings from your, for your brain is secondary in your perception of the world and yourself whereas the introverts have it the vice versa so it's more difficult and so, so this is a, a dichotomy and another dichotomy is dealing with the perception perception of the information that's and that's the two ones but one is called sensing which means you perceive the information via your senses first so you touch things or you watch things and that that's exactly that's exactly what happens if the people first like to get the algorithms and go through the algorithms so those people who are this s type like this and the people who are the n type prefer very much to get the to get the general picture first because they have to intuitively have the idea to intuitively see what's going on and then they are able to use their senses and, and, and test those things the next one is again the perception part of the whole picture but it's rather dealing with was how the perceived information is then worked out in your brain so it's either by a feeling so you just have some some feeling whether it works or doesn't that's the f time or you you very, very carefully think about what you perceive. It's not dependent that you were sending, sensing or intuition part. And the last one is just out of what, what Jung was talking about as the judging and perception, and that's the behavior in groups of people if you have to, to deal with them. So, so judging means that you decide and you let your workers to do what you plan for Whereas the perceiving ones are all the time change, waiting whether, whether the things will be changing or, or whether it's the final situation and, and he never ever wants to conclude with a fixed plan. So here is the distribution of the individual 16 types in population. So that was some statistics from states some 10 years back. So, so you see that actually, actually about if, if you count it together, so the N people are only about 25% of population while the, while the S people are about 75% of population. So you see that if you want to please your class, so it's very, po very probable that 75% would prefer to have exercises first and theory then. I, I made some experiments, I will come back to that with my own big classes and it very much it very much was like that. Also you see that the distribution of the people with successful carriers is then also very much depending on which which group they are. So I will not go into any detail things only half of the table. Yeah, but you see that in the management and etc. So there are there are very much the people which are S and T at the same time. So sensing, making things simple, and thinking, and judging. Yeah, you see, that's very, very helpful in the retail, small business, managing, banking, etc. So, just to go on, the time, the time is also going to the end. I was told to, to have about 40 minutes of talk, and then there should be enough time for discussion. So. I hope you will you will come to some discussion in the end. So, so any questions so far? The questions could be posed in Russian, and I will answer in Russian. Then, at least I will try. Not yet. So let's go on. So I just I just try to follow this a little bit. When I was asked, so it's already about 13 years back. I was asked by our colleagues at Faculty of Informatics to redesign completely their, 
basic mathematics course. And, and our, our informatics people, they are interested in getting serious mathematics background for the students, but at the same time, they do not want to invest too much time to them. So, so what, what was going out of them in the full version of the course, it was four semesters, four hours per week of the lectures and two hours of tutorials. So if you look at it as a one course, it's not too bad. It's just, so our semesters have got about 13 weeks, so it's quite many hours of lectures. But it should, it had to cover all the mathematics except of graph theory and some, some logic because they dealt with that in their, in their informatics stuff themselves. So our strategy was, or my strategy back in 2004, was that I wanted to focus on very practical topics with easygoing intuition and rather simple algorithms. So therefore, I will just show it as consequences straight now, therefore we decided not to base the teaching of mathematics on, on the classical uh, infinitesimal analysis because we thought, or I thought, that it's much simpler to go via the discrete versions. And for the informatics people, they simply don't know the continuous, they don't need the continuous mathematics until they come to some convergence of processes and robustness of computations. But you don't have to start with that. So, so the first semester of the big course was definitely dealing with very discrete stuff, starting with a quite long warm up coming back to the secondary school topics, but with a different angle of view, and building matrix calculus, and building some applications, and doing some, some biological modeling, and, and, and a, bit of, a bit of stochastics things, but again discrete, and some, some classical geometry, etc. So, so that, was, that was the first semester, and although the topics were quite simple in the beginning, so we, we really tried to, to mix it with, with so, so, and the approach was that the simpler, the simpler the topic explained was, the more detailed I told, and the more advanced it was, the more it was just, just a set of hints for the students to, to follow them and, and, and work it out themselves. And so we, we really just moved in spirals and came back to the topics later again and again. In the second semester, we, we followed up with the continuous analysis, but not treating it very long, telling all of the discrete variants and versions of the things in parallel, never, never allowing to, to, to get dicked too, too deep into some particular technical topic, always trying to simplify things. So for example, I don't know, once we had the integral, at our hands, so of course we immediately do the Fourier transform and things like that, but only for Riemann integrable stuff with compact support, and then everything is easy. And you can tell them, you can tell them, well, guys, and if you want to do it for more advanced stuff, you have to work harder and read a couple of more hundreds of great pages. But that's that's not necessary to know now. So so that's how we did it, and. I can now summarize the goals and also the conditions. Yes? Duff? Nie ma. Вопрос можете задать? Да, конечно. Вы знаете, мне по моему опыту, многолетнему математическому опыту, стало ясно что если душа не принимает, научить ничему невозможно. А где в математике душа? Вы же чем-то духовным должны оперировать, чтобы душа приняла. А? В математике где душа? Но это... Это, конечно, вопрос сложный, потому что зависит от того, с какой точки зрения мы это будем обсуждать. С точки зрения инженеров, самое важное – это математический подход. Значит, заключать только тогда, когда есть какой-то, э, ну, chain, chain of arguments. 
Да? Если с точки зрения уже любителя мати математики, то душа просто в красоте доказательств, в красоте конструкции, в красоте, как, как просто создать все эти, все эти концепции. Но такой красоте невозможно никого научить. Это, это все люди, как, вы, как вы говорите, это, это люди просто одни должны работать, понимать и потом, потом и, и понравиться. Это, не знаю, если это ответ, но, но с точки зрения образования, вот для других, если начинаем с этого, то это только, это только преподаватель говорит о том, какая красота, но никто не понимает. Да, но к этому можно дойти через, через просто процедуру, когда впервые применяют что-то, им нравится. Потом кто-то подумает, почему это работает. Понимает, продолжает думать, может быть, будет еще лучше работать. И потом, если что-то создает, и вот красота. Well, so, so the goals, the goals in our course was that the students should not only learn to formulate the definitions and concepts and, and prove some simple mathematical results, because That was at least the only thing which was examined when I was in the school. But they should in particular learn how to perceive the meaning also of, of black box concepts. So simply, they should be told. They should be, they, they, they must go in parallel. And there must be very clean distinction between when I tell that something works and they should be able to understand how it works and how it, how it could be used. And when I tell them, now we understood how it works and we have proved it, it's two different things. But in the, in the elementary lectures, at least at the service teaching, but I'm quite convinced that in the beginning of the pure mass courses, it should, should be present too. They have to learn also how to, how to perceive the meaning even for roughly formulated properties and relations and outlooks. Something in the sense, we have proved that the Fourier transform works exactly this way for the Riemann integrable things with compact support. And that's a complete proof. And that's clean and that's complete. And of course, if we want to work with Dirac delta functions, etc., you can just indicate via approximations that it should work the way you claim. But you, you have no time to prove it. And if you postpone everything, even the elementary things, to the time you have everything at your disposal, so first of all, no engineering education would, contain, would, would, would have it contained. And second, it's too late. The, the people never get used to, to the real concepts of why it has been done. So, so that's why I strongly believe you have to, to seek for balance. And the most important point is really to make a clear and clean distinction between what has been proved and what has been claimed. So, and last but not least, they should also understand the instructions and algorithms which are then used as mathematical models and they should be able to talk about those models. Yeah, yeah. соответствие потребностей и возможностей. Взаимно однозначное соответствие. И как только ваши ученики поймут, что им нужно, они должны узнать, а с помощью чего это можно получить. И тогда любой предмет, в том числе и математика, выставится очень хорошую цепочку возможностей и потребностей и из взаимного удовлетворения. Да, конечно, это правильно, но надо, если просто есть четыре семестра, надо там просто дать людям какую-то какую картину общую, то, конечно, там баланс должен быть очень-очень специальный. Там, там надо не только доказывать все полностью, но тоже показывать, как этим пользоваться и так дальше. Да, это тоже я веду. So, <coughs> So
So another thing is that we have to face, so the conditions have changed completely. So we have to face the different habits and different approaches of the new generation. So we, I don't know whether, whether many of you were here in the afternoon block of the, of the architectural design and, and, and links to the use of the rooms was here, it was fascinating. And there, one of the lecturers was, was telling that he couldn't imagine he would stay for eight hours in the classical classrooms because he can't stand that for three. And he's already adult and, and sort of disciplined and organized. And, and how could the small kids? So of course, we can say that, that part of the goal of the grammar school is to get the discipline and to be able to sit for six hours, say, in the classroom. But uh, we have to respect also that the kids are coming to the university or to the secondary school in a, so mentally, in a completely different condition than what we used to see earlier. In particular, the, at least, again, in Central Europe, there is a big lack of, of systematic work or, or interest. So the people stopped to go for long movies because it's too long. They prefer to have these sitcoms, which are never more than 20 minutes for one piece, right? They wouldn't read long books. They prefer the comics and, and similars. So, so there, are, there are big studies for that, which say that the average, average American teenager can't focus for more than eight seconds. Well, I can't, can't believe that, but maybe it's 40, but definitely it's not 40 minutes, it's 40 seconds. So, so they are working in typical environment for work is not just one sheet of paper and pencil and, and, and table. The environment is, of course, screen, and on the screen you have at least five windows in parallel, open. <coughs> they work on something and chat in, in three more windows, etc. So we have to face this, and definitely, Definitely the very standard approach of long lectures and tutorials and, and exams is a bit outdated. And I'm, I'm facing it as the head of the institute. And I know that I can't start the revolution just telling the people do it different way because they don't want to. But it's something we have to think about. So, so definitely not only the goals and the conditions are changing, but uh, in particular we have also to to change the, the way how we address the students and the homeworks we are designing and the, the, the works they are doing. So I don't know whether it's a crucial problem here in, in Russia, but it definitely is with us. So the average, average student at mathematics, they come from the secondary school and unlike, say, chemistry or biology, where they are thrown into the labs and they work math 12 hours a day or 16 just to get through all the protocols and everything, at mass, they go to the lectures. They find out they are not obligatory, so they don't go to the lectures. And then they come to the exam time, and, and during the exam time, they fail. So who cares? So, so the system is very, very flexible with us, so they can just enroll again into the course, second time. The second time, they learn already that, that in Czech, in Czech the, the word for exam is the same as the word for trying things. So we are completely convinced that nowadays the student would never have the idea that they are examined. They are just trying whether they pass. Yeah, so so it's, a, it's a big problem. And I think, I think that if we, if we revert the order of the exposition and enforce them first to work with simple algorithms, but in, involving a lot of work on their side, just to simulate a little bit the bio biological labs, etc., and then immediately after that, force them to think about what they were doing. That it would be very nice. So I don't know whether whether I find many followers with that way of thinking, but definitely I'm quite convinced it would be necessary. So that's roughly what I what I already told. So they are used to to work in parallel. They got very different understanding of face-to-face -face communication. That's, that's an important point I wanted to make because that's, that's a hint how to, how to change the approach. Because nowadays, the students, so the young people, I saw it with my kids. So in principle, they understand face-to-face -face communication 
chatting with someone over the screen. And if there is a picture of the person or even a, even a video of the person, that's an absolutely perfect individual face-to-face -face communication. So that this helps to, to use new practices and you can, you can just have this swap classroom principle and you can just, just really give the students first the work to, work to work on and to think about, to enforce them to discuss about that in, in pairs or groups, etc. And then the tutorials can look completely different. So that's something which is not, not taken seriously enough. And in particular, it should mean because just what I wanted to point out is the different typologies of the people. I think the system should be flexible enough to allow the students themselves to choose the order. And just to conclude, we just were following our experience over, over these 10 years of, of uh, teaching of these service courses, which were provided just in the most classical way, like, like we had the exposition and the tutorials as, as it always was. But we at least tried to, to have some, some texts underlying these, these courses and then, then the project was accepted by Springer. So there, there should appear a very unconventional textbook which we call Brisk Guide to Mathematics. And it comes with a very unconventional layout. The layout is the book is printed two columns like, like dictionaries are, except the two columns are just two parallel books. One of them is just a series of the, of the tutorial-like things, just practical algorithmic things, so, so just tasks and explanations how to solve them, while the other column is just running through and has got, has got just the theory there. And the link is only rough, so, so plus minus, say, two, three pages. So it's not meant like you would see immediately on the left what you have got in theory on the right. And what we say is the, the, the readers should just decide and find their path themselves, exactly as I had on the previous slide. And to allow them to do that, there are there are the small pictures, as you see in the right hand column, there are two of them, and what we, we call them emoticons. And they are used as a switch. And we don't explain what they mean. We just try to use them systematically. So, for example, the ghost, the, the right hand one in the first row, is of course somewhere where, where it's rather hints how to do the next bit yourself. Except I strongly believe that for some people it will be just an invited sign, oh, finally something interesting. But most of the readers will just skip it. And we try to write it in such a way that if you skip to the next more mild or, or friendly picture, then you shouldn't lose the context. So it's always just, just switched this way. So, so altogether it will be about 1,000 pages like that. And we hope very much to finalize it one day. So. The contract says it should be this January, but definitely we can't can't keep this. Oh, okay. So that's the last one. So that all the pictures I was using are illustrations from that book. So now the time for the questions. Thanks. Thanks for the attention. Thank you for your very interesting lecture. I have a question. Could you please say what is your main achievements as a math teacher? Well, I I never taught small kids, so I, I can't tell anything about about say the main bulk of population I, I try to address today. In math teaching, I had I had a few of very successful students as graduate students, so I'm just an ordinary university professor. And my approach is my approach is that I very much try in the big classes, say if I have there say two, three, four hundred people, as at the informatics you get, I unlike my colleagues, I claim that 
I claim that uh, the, say, half of the students who are not the best ones is doing exactly the same way independent of whether you put a bit more material there or a bit less material there. They simply don't learn much. Whereas the best 10%, if they are fed with something nice, they are excited and they learn a lot. So, so my feedback from students, so we have got this general feedback run by our information system. So I'm very much below the average in average, but every time I get some very high appreciation by the very best students. So I'm proud of that. So I don't know whether I should, but I am. I always try to, to run the course in such a way that, that I don't kill the weaklings, but I don't want to adjust the course for them. Thank you for the answer. Пожалуйста, еще вопросы? Добрый день. У меня, знаете, такой вопрос по поводу того, что сейчас студенты теряют внимательность и очень сложно обучать, ну, то есть очень сложно держать внимание. Ну, то есть могут сосредоточиться очень коротко и на некоторых вещах. У меня сразу есть один вопрос. Скажите, пожалуйста, выборка у вас студентов какая? Сейчас я задам вопрос. Когда я заканчивала университет, я заканчивала Нехват в 85 году, полностью весь университет, ну, то есть выпуск студентов, это полностью обучение пятикурсное было 7,5 тысяч студентов. 2009 год это было 17,5 тысяч студентов. Понятное дело, что людей, которые готовы обучиться математике, ну, в таком количестве гораздо меньше, да? То есть из семи с половиной, я не знаю, сколько тогда было, допустим, 200 человек. Сейчас мы умножаем 200 на 4, получаем большую выборку. Есть ли у вас такая проблема? То есть вы начинаете учить большее количество людей, но меньше приспособлены для обучения математики? Да, это так верно. У нас в университете мы ну, приступили к этому вообще еще по-другому, потому что у нас вступительные экзамены. Да. Они всегда были, они существуют. И, и в большинстве случаев в информатике, в математике мы ограничиваемся, огранич... ну, как это? мы просто приглашаем людей только на, на э, такие тесты, которые, которые рассматривают общую способность, да, общую способность. А вот, эти, вот этим проходит эти экзамены, одинаковый экзамен, одинаковый экзамен для всех, для юристов, для философов, для, для будущих учителей и так далее. Есть медицина, например, у них еще добавительные, да. А э, значит, значит, мы видим, как, как распространено, как ну, способности как распространяются, потому что там, у каждого человека там что-то как, не знаю, 16 тысяч в год приходит студентов сдать экзамен, да, и у каждого будет вот этот процент, как они сдать, да, и, и видно, что, скажем, это очень жалко, что, например, на педагогические факультеты входят студенты с процентом 40, на психологию 99, не знаю почему, на математику мы где-то 60-70, но это из-за того, что они не, они не глупые, но они, они не интересуются. Да? Эти общие, общая способность, там есть разные, почти никто все не, не знает, не умеет. Да? Значит, на математике не так плохо. На информатике, когда, когда я там читал лекции, скажем, 20 лет назад, там было... На курсе был, скажем, человек 70, из этого было 35 очень хороших. Теперь там человек 400 и 35 очень хороших. Но, но надо сказать, что просто в Брно, Брно информатики занимаются на трех университетах. У нас что-то как 2000 выпускников в год всего. А это не хватит. А все время иностранцев приглашают, там развитие такое быстрое. И все выпускники, они хорошо работу находят. А тоже они в математике не очень хорошо, никого не интересует. 
А из-за того они тоже не интересуются. Они, они думают, математика не, не нужна. Я же уже умею там, там Java, и C, и Perl, и все умею, там, странички красивые делают ребята. У них у всех уже работа, когда учатся. Да. Значит, я, я бы не сказал, что они, они как-то не такие хорошие, как раньше. У них интересы другие, у них же, они уже работают, да, у них взгляды другие. Вот как. Спасибо большое. Пожалуйста, вот молодой человек. Hi. Yeah, uh, my name is Sergei. I'm from Tomsk State University and Tomsk Polytechnical University and a little bit from Tomsk State Pedagogical University. Um, thank you for your lecture and I have a question. Uh, at present time, a lot of uh, staff from administration, they very inspired with uh, massive online courses. They think that if we move away a teacher, a person, and make uh, just online courses, it will be great. It will be much more results. But we have already all this information in internet, and we don't have a lot of experts in, in mathematics and in, in science. So what is your opinion about these MOOCs? MOOCs. <clears throat> well, I mean, I mean MOOCs, as technology, as, a, as an opportunity, is a great thing. And it has been used as a great thing when, say, MIT or, or other great institutions just deliver their own MOOC series, which are available mostly for free. Or there is a mixed business concept where you can see it for free, but you can pay for exam. And you, then you get a certificate, which is very wise. Yeah? Because if it's really good, then the people just know it's very much appreciated and then it might be that you even need the certificate and then you pay. Uh, in at a university like say ours, I don't think that it makes much sense to to create your own line of MOOCs. But the same technology can be used for what I indicated a little bit there when I talked about the the alternative approach. And I very strongly believe that, and I tried to do something similar in my own lecture. So for example, recently I never ever produced at a blackboard for a big group of people like, like the inf informatics courses. I never produced their complete proofs of something complicated because no one follows. You see, yeah? at, the, at, the, at the point you start working on something complicated as a proof, they start to chat and write emails. And, 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 and. That doesn't make any sense. So instead, I just I just have it available online because it's easy to, to create such things nowadays. It's very, very cheap technology or even without. So I very much believe that something like a series of these MOOC type things should cover a big part of courses cut into very small bricks and enforcing that the students just have the duty to go through before coming to the lectures or seminars. And then, then the lectures could be much more interactive and you can keep their attention. And, and you even can tease them because if they didn't come through, it's, it's very easy. You just, you just set a homework saying, saying, listen to this particular five minute long thing and use the method explained at the, at the time, I don't know, 187 seconds. That's exactly what they are able to do, and they don't find it weird. And they go to the say to the place, they listen, they they look at the algorithm, then they can work it out. Yeah? And then they come, and if they don't have it, they fail. And if they have it, they can talk about it, and you can continue. So, so that's exactly what I meant with particularly or partly uh, implementing this swapped swapped classroom approach. And that's exactly what I also meant. I will not be able to convince my colleagues to do so. Вопрос молодой человек, пожалуйста. Здравствуйте, добрый вечер. Прежде всего хочу сказать спасибо за лекцию, очень интересно, очень полезно для нас, для меня. Я выпускник Томского политического университета, сейчас работаю в школе. И этот вопрос очень актуальный, вы затрагивали проблемы важные для меня, которые я пытаюсь решить. 
А одна из них, почему некоторые дети в какой-то момент времени перестают любить математику, любить читать. Некоторые изначально не любят, а некоторые просто потом перестают. А, и, и мне интересно было особенно про перцепцию услышать, про восприятие. Есть ли какие-то методы диагностики перцепции? Вот, вот например, где у меня вот этот прибор, клика. А, I mean, if you if you go for, for this MBTI, so MBTI is a world worldwide accepted name of that. I don't know how in Russia, but I'm sure you, you must find it much easier than in Czech. And even in Czech Republic, you can Google a site where you can run through tests. The psychologists have got some well-designed tests, many of those, and you just it's it's very mechanistic. Yeah? You just fill in some form, answer questions, and in the end, it tells you exactly where you are in the table. The problem why the psychologists do, don't respect this method is that simply the dichotomies are handled by, by counting some points, and there is some, some, some decision point in the middle and whatever is left is just the left one, and whatever is right is the right one. But that's too simplistic. So from the psychological point of view, you should only count the cases where it's very much polarized. So, so many people are somewhere in the middle. And then if you repeat the test or, or let them do another kind of the same type of test, then after three months, they happen to be in a completely different group. And therefore the, Psychology study is just a wrong method. But the HR people like it, and if you use it with some reasonable, with some reasonable, say, approach, just taking it seriously only if the polarization is strong enough, then I think the, the reliability is not that bad. I got, I got currently a, a, also a, a young person like you who is, who is working at a school and, and he came back to, to, to do PhD in a distant form and he just picked up this problem and he, he, he tries to, to make some set of, of tests and experiments just to test how much it works with the mathematics and how important the match of the typology between the teacher and the, the pupils is, etc. So I can't say how it will end, but I discuss it with psychologists. They find it extremely interesting. So, for example, I was really, I was really shocked and, and, and a bit sick out of that for a couple of months because I, I discussed it a long time back with psychologists and then it happened that they invited me to give them a special talk about the reflection of Jung's typology in perception of mathematics at some very special meeting devoted to the 25th year of their association. And I was so worried. <laughs> But it went well, finally. Спасибо. И у меня еще такой небольшой вопрос. Вы говорили, что тяжело работать с большими группами, то есть где много учеников, студентов. А как вы осуществляете такой подход? Как вы работаете с большими группами? У вас есть индивидуальный подход какой-то, ну хотя бы группами, разделять их на подгруппы какие-то, или вы стараетесь какие-то общие методы подбирать? Ну я больше всего. Ну, там, там зависит от, от возможностей, конечно, там, там крупный факультет, там, ну, там, там просто уроки про математику, там не самые главные. То, значит, что, то что я старался, я старался, чтобы, чтобы сделать эти спирали не очень большие. Значит, значит если спирали маленькие, то можно, можно это рассматривать так, что, что практика с предыдущего служит как ведение в следующее. А, а просто там только, только ну, как на английском face shift у этих людей, да, то есть это, это, это был попыток такой. Но, но в общем, я не очень много умел. И другое, что можно делать, просто, просто раз, разлагать вот эти лекции на, на что-то, что на самом деле там случится, случится да, за 
и, и, и поддержка, которая онлайн. И потом, конечно, люди, это я тоже делал, что просто вычисление и показывал, как, как, можно, как можно работать с алгоритмами, которые просто вытекают из лекции, которая будет. Но я показывал это студентам уже раньше. Значит, это зависит. Это потом они могли или перед докладом, перед лекцией, или после. И я спрашивал, как они к этому относятся. И это, это ответ был, конечно, я, я старался просто узнать только от тех, которые занимались. Да? А у них, скажем, там было людей, скажем, 50-60, как бы там сидели, там, там вот было что-то как 80% предпочитал очень сильно первые практические занятия, потом, потом э, как-то показывать, почему и как это работает. И только 20% подтверждало вообще невозможно, я бы никогда не сумел. Да? Точно как вот по теории должно да, быть. И заключительный наш вопрос. Огромное спасибо за вашу лекцию. У меня вот такой вопрос. Вот э, подход спиралевидного погружения постепенного, он э, чрезвычайно такой э, очень вкусный. И может создаться такое ощущение, что это применимо абсолютно ко всем дисциплинам. У меня вопрос такой. Ваши коллеги по университету используют ли этот подход спиралевидного погружения э, в своих дисциплинах? Или существуют какие-то дисциплины, на ваш взгляд, которые по этой методике не могут преподаваться, то есть отлично, то есть они не подходят к этому подходу? Это мне, это мне неизвестно. Я, я боюсь, что на нашем университете просто люди не очень занимаются. Там просто каждый, каждый большой исследователь, и он еще тоже там, читает лекции. И большинство коллег, они читают лекции для своих наследников. А воспытывают тоже. Они очень гордятся, что за всю жизнь просто появились, скажем, два-три наследника. Да? И в дальнейших тысяча пять студентов, которые прошли курсами, это неинтересно. То я просто не знаю. Но, но в, общем, в общем, почти все очень приступают так традиционно. Скажем, скажем я занимался, я, я говорил очень много про это с, с деканом медицины, когда мы вдвое там всегда старались как управлять университетом. И он не, он не объяснял, как, как это они, они рассчитывают в медицине. Это очень, наверное, хороший вопрос, хороший ответ. Они у нас очень классически просто бросают всех в анатомию и формат, вот это формат цифтику, да, еще что-то. Это известно, что это обозначает, надо выучить три списка телефонных. Да? номер просто наизусть. Они говорят, это очень хороший такой вступительный тест. Кто не пройдет, не пройдет. А те, которые пройдут, они еще потом выучат, как, как просто связи, что делать, потом и больницы, там это все просто позже. И, и говорят, что, конечно, есть второй подход, где они впервые просто про, впервые про, про как-то, ну, как, как вот все эти системы работают, говорят, да, вот такой общий, общую картинку, да, как, как вот все устроено, и потом, потом идут вниз к деталям и, и объясняют, как, как кого зовут, какой босс, какой мышец, да. И он говорил, что во всей Чехословакии только один медицинский факультет приступает к этому таким образом, но он только для очень хороших студентов. Средние студенты это не сумеют, это просто слишком, слишком сложно. А не знаю, если как, как бы в медицине могли просто так, так по степени просто делать, чтобы, наверное, не умеют. Да. В математике, я думаю, это возможно. Там, там, просто, там просто не доход. Там после Ваевштрасса и дальнейшие, потом все эти гурбакисты, да, это, это, это один ужас, что что теперь большинство людей, которые в Европе преподают математику, то они уже никакой другой не видят, только это бурбакистское. Да? А это система, которую создали, чтобы, чтобы, чтобы просто в библиотеке 
окончательные формулировки всех результатов достали. Да? Но одни эти бурбакисты так никогда не работали, они, они на, на нормальном языке да, общались. А это, это будет еще долго. Я думаю, в России проблема никогда не была такой, такой огромной. Там, там просто много людей в Москве говорили, что, что бурбак это обозначало кто-то, кто не умеет хорошо объяснять здесь, совсем формально все. Но у нас это, это вообще очень позитивно, если, если про кого-то скажу, это хороший бурбак. Да? Он просто все, все совсем правильно, совсем, совсем явно, совсем абстрактно. Да? Спасибо большое, Ян.